Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of President and Mrs. George Bush, welcome to the George Bush Presidential Library Center here on the campus of Texas A&M University. My name is Fred McClure, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of the Foundation. And we want to thank you all for being here this evening. And for those of you that are watching online via the internet, we welcome you as well. Thanks to the generous and longtime support of Mrs. Flo Cameron Creighton, this evening's foundation event is the William Waldo Cameron Forum on Public Affairs. Though Ms. Creighton could not be with us this evening, I'd like to thank her publicly for her continuous and her steadfast support of the foundation. Now for the recognition of special guests. Though you have acknowledged them already this evening, please welcome the 41st President of the United States and his First Lady and ours, George and Barbara Bush. I would also like to thank the Texas A&M University Press for its partnership with our foundation in this evening's Forum on Public Affairs. Please recognize Dr. Charles Backus, Director of the University Press, and in addition, three members of the University Press's Advancement Board, Dr. Davis Ford, Mr. Charlie Seeley, and Mrs. Daisy White. Would you guys? Finally, I'd like to recognize Mr. Warren Finch, Executive Director of the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum, and my fellow member of the Foundation's Board of Directors, the Honorable Andy Cart. Guys. <laughs> President Bush referred to him as a great statesman, inspiring and also wise. Speaking in the Rose Garden of the White House six months into his first year as president, President Bush talked about when he was just a few months shy of his 17th birthday and how he heard Sir Winston Churchill implore America, give us the tools and we will finish the job, Churchill said. At a dinner hosted in London by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher a month later, a month before, President Bush described Churchill as America's first partner in leadership, really, when we were challenged together by war. Tonight, we are most privileged to have the granddaughter of America's first partner in leadership, Mrs. Celia Sands, as our Cameron Forum on Public Affairs guest speaker, an internationally acclaimed author, journalist, television presenter, and speaker. Ms. Sands is the daughter of Sir Winston Churchill's eldest child, Diana. Mrs. Sands has published five books on various aspects of Churchill's life. They combine intensive historical research with personal anecdotes recalled from the time she spent with him in England and abroad. Her most recent book, We Shall Not Fail, The Inspiring Leadership of Winston Churchill, describes the principles of leadership which enabled Britain's prime minister from 1940 to 1945, Winston Churchill, to lead his country and the rest of the free world to overwhelming victory against Nazi Germany and its allies in World War II. Tonight, we'll get to hear memories of my grandfather, Winston Churchill. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mrs. Cedar Sands. President and Mrs. Bush, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Fred McClure and his staff at the, at the Bush Foundation for having me here tonight, and, and Flora Cameron for her sponsorship, and the generous friends who have made this evening possible. Also, Charles Backus at A&M Press for his work in publishing my first two books several years after they've gone out of print. I'm really happy to be with you tonight in this magnificent library and greatly honored by your presence, President and Mrs. Bush. I was so excited when I was going to come to meet you, but I had no idea it was going to be such fun. <laughs> when ears were deaf and tongues were mute, you told of doom to come. When others fingered on the flute, 
you thundered on the drum. When armies marched and cities burned and all you said came true, those who had mocked your warnings turned almost too late to you. And doubt gave way to firm belief and through five cruel years, you gave us glory in our grief and laughter through our tears. When final honours are bestowed and last accounts are done, then shall we know how much was owed by all the world to one. This is how millions of people, both in Britain and around the world, regarded Winston Churchill in 1945. People often ask me, what is my favorite memory of my grandfather? This is an impossible question. I only knew one of my grandfathers and naturally assumed that he was just like anyone else's grandfather. I never gave it a lot of thought, but if I'd had to describe a grandfather, he would have been a loving and much loved man, dressed in a siren suit, which is what you call a jumpsuit, I don't know anyone, I'm sure you, Mr. President, have seen the film where he was doing on the White House lawn. He was showing it to the photographers and he was up, pulling the zip up and down in rather <laughs> a saucy way. Or puff, and puffing on a large cigar with absolutely everyone, secretaries, colleagues, friends and family, running around to make his life as comfortable as possible. A grandfather was a man who seemed to have endless knowledge and interests who recited poetry, made people laugh, and loved animals, and walked around his garden at Chartwell, and above all, enjoyed painting. One day, a present for me arrived, with the message saying, please look after him, your loving grandpapa. In feverish excitement, I unwrapped this unwieldy looking parcel, which is about this big, wrapped in brown paper, and in it, I found a life-size toy bulldog. <laughs> it was a magnificent creature with a head that moved from side to side when I pulled him along. My mother explained that someone had sent him to my grandfather because he thought that I might like him. I did, but I wanted to know why would anyone send a grown man a toy dog, <laughs> particularly when he had a, a real live dog of his own. So I asked my mother, and she said that during the war, he'd been known as the Great British Bulldog. Armed with that explanation, I set off for school the next day, determined to find out what my friends thought of this and what, what their grandfathers were, what sort of dog. <laughs> they were puzzled. I think their mothers were amused. But little by little, it dawned on me that there was something very special about my mother's father with whom I'd spent a lot of time when I was growing up. This didn't come suddenly. It was really by watching how the grown-ups behaved when they were with him or when they were speaking about him. Somehow, I realized little by little that they, were, they regarded him as someone special. But the first 21 years are full of recollections in which he plays a part. And whatever the mood, my abiding memory is of warmth, affection, and humor. When he was a child, the young Winston and his brother Jack used to spend their holidays in the charge of their nanny at Blenheim Palace, the ancestral home of the Churchills and the birthplace of Winston. They would be there under the watchful eye of their grandmother, the very stern Seventh Duchess, and had a wonderful time running around in the Great Park. I'm sure many of you have been and visited Blenheim. My brother and sister and I had similar holidays, albeit on a smaller scale, when we would go either to Chequers, our equivalent in Britain of your Camp David, or my, a chart for my grandparents' country home in Kent. Like our grandfather, we were always accompanied by our nanny. Churchill described his nanny, Mrs. Everest, like this. He said, my nurse was my confidant. It was to her I poured out all my many troubles. And when she died in 1894, he said he had lost my dearest and most intimate friend 
during the whole of the 20 years that I had lived. Probably as a direct result of his relationship with Mrs. Everest, my grandfather had a great affinity for my nanny, who I'm sure brought back many happy memories of his old friend. Both of these strong-minded and upright women would certainly have laid down their lives for their charges. During the war, there was no question of any discussion of defeat in our house. But that did not stop my nanny thinking and planning. Convinced, no doubt with good reason, that if Hitler invaded Britain, his first target would be my grandfather and his family. She knew she must be ready. We had all inherited our grandfather's red locks. A lot of people don't know that Winston Churchill had hair very much this colour. But he, he did. But we all remember him with white hair. And so Nanny's plan was to dye our red hair black and take us to live in her parents' pub in Liverpool. <laughs> if she's had to, I'm sure she would have succeeded. But fortunately, she didn't have to put this into operation. But one day, when London was being heavily bombed and our parents were away, Nanny called Downing Street and was so forceful that an armoured car was there in minutes to take us down to Chequers. And waiting there on the steps was the Prime Minister, who greeted us with the words, Poor little shelter brats. <laughs> the Chequers' visits in the early 50s, when he was Prime Minister for the second time, I remember well. The war had been over for six years, and I had never known life without rationing of food or clothes. There was no Victorian policy of the children being seen and not heard, or only speaking when they were spoken to in my grandparents' house. As soon as we could hold a knife and fork and sit in a proper chair, we were at the dining room table, regardless of the company. Presidents, politicians, and diplomats may have been surprised to find us there, but for us, the excitement of being with the grown-ups was diminished slightly by having to behave accordingly throughout interminable meals. <laughs> the meals were long, and of course they were enjoyable, but when you had a lot of them, my mother, in fact, left home to get married because she said she couldn't take another meal. <laughs> the first Christmas I can really remember was at Chequers in 1951. Hollywood could not have done better than my grandmother, who was a perfectionist in everything she did. It seemed to me that we had the tallest tree and the biggest turkey and hundreds of presents all set out in family groups around the great hall. It was so exciting. We had carols and tea parties, Father Christmas and crowds, and, and they all gathered to greet us at, at church on Christmas Day. And while we celebrated, the country, of course, still had to be run. A team of secretaries were in attendance night and day, pens poised, ready to take dictation from the Prime Minister who'd be dressed in his velvet siren suit and slippers to match with his initials monogrammed in gold. Every night we dressed for dinner, or the grown-ups did anyway, but he didn't put on a tuxedo. He put on his velvet siren suit, which he'd invented during the war so he could jump out of bed and just zip himself up. <laughs> These family occasions were interspersed with grand events, at which, if possible, we children were included. There was the coronation, which we watched from the Home Office balcony in Whitehall, and shrieked with joy as Grandpapa leant right out of his carriage and waved to us with his hat. We thought he was going to fall right out. There was his installation as a Knight of the Garter at St. George's Chapel, Windsor. And then there was the lying in state of Queen Mary in Westminster Hall. My sister and I got into terrible trouble because my, my parents, for some reason, thought that we were quite trustworthy and we would behave. I think I was about six and she was ten. And so we were left in a window in the yard by the, by the Houses of Parliament and the coffin went past. The next morning, there was a photograph in the newspapers of two little girls roaring with laughter with their heads on the top of the coffin. <laughs> Our parents, I think, they weren't cross because I think they realized it was entirely their fault, but it was a very good 
a very good lesson to never smile on a solemn occasion when there might be a camera around. My grandfather's 80th birthday was a cause for some concern in the family. The problem was the portrait that had been commissioned by Parliament as a present to him. And presumably, they'd intended to give pleasure. That the rumour was out that it was less than flattering. I remember my parents wondering how he was going to react. But whatever the concern, no one was prepared for the horror of the painting when it was unveiled. To a horrified gasp from the audience, the recipient observed with a wry smile and characteristic humour, it is a remarkable example of modern art. <laughs> <clears throat> My grandmother knew what she was going to do with it. She had no intention that in future generations would see this por horrendous portrait, which is all in grisly shades of, of green and yellow and grey, and certainly made him look even older than he was then, and we assumed it would have been done more to characterize how he'd been in the 1940s. So she took it straight down to Chartwell and had a ceremonial burning with the gardener. <laughs> Once out of office, family life centered on Chartwell, the place that Churchill liked best. He used to say, a day away from Chartwell is a day wasted. He did mean that, but it didn't stop him traveling because he needed to travel to he needed Chartwell and he needed foreign travel. So he managed to combine them both, both. And Chartwell was very definitely the safe haven and the harbor which he would return to. It was at Chartwell that we found him most relaxed. We would visit him in the morning and find him having breakfast in bed, surrounded by the newspapers, with Toby, his budgerigar, flying around the room and taking little nibbles of his toast, Rufus, his poodle, running around, and his marmalade cat curled up on the bed. Confident that he would appear, we would wait patiently for him to be ready to go for a walk. And then, accompanied by Rufus, we'd set off to feed the fish which shram swam around in the ponds that he'd made himself. And he would throw the food in, and they'd come to the surface. He'd say, look, they know me. Well, of course they did, <laughs> but we believed him for a while. And then we would go and feed the black swans that had been a present from the Australian government. And we never liked them, but we didn't like to show that we were frightened of them because they were very fierce. And then we would go to visit the pigs. And so my grandfather liked pigs. And so, but he, he, the man who'd won the Nobel Prize for Literature couldn't think of anything more original to say to the pig when he stroked its back than oink, oink. Grandpapa's birthday on the 30th of November was a command performance. We all wanted to be there. There was always a magnificent cake and champagne sparkling in the clinking glasses and, of course, the aroma of good Havana cigars. Cigars were, of course, the obvious present. And I used to go with my mother to German Street and to buy a single cigar for him. And Obviously, the cigar had been pre-chosen, but I was always given a choice of three or four, and solemnly I would pick one. They were probably all the same, I think. But I can still feel the joyful excitement as I proudly sat on Grandpapa's knee while he puffed away on my cigar. My abiding memories of him are at the dining room table at Chartwell, and I do recommend anyone who goes to England to go to Chartwell. It's a really lovely, lovely day out from London. Here we would gather for elegant and sumptuous meals, every one of them an occasion. And dressed as usual in one of his siren suits, he was at his happiest, surrounded by as many members of his family as possible. He treasured family life. He'd had rather a bleak childhood, and certainly no, not much of a sort of jolly or cosy family life. So he, his greatest joy was to see as many of his descendants around the table as possible. And in my mind's eye, these events are still bathed in an aura of glowing luxury. While well, my grandmother made sure that the food was perfect, my grandfather was not content until everyone's glass was filled with champagne. As a result of his taste for the good things in life, 
It is on occasion suggested that he smoked more cigars and consumed more alcohol than was good for him. There's no doubt that he did. On one occasion, he was in the Houses of Parliament and Bessie Braddock, a Labour MP, came up to her and said, Winston, you're drunk. And he said, and Madam, you are ugly. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I shall be sober, but you will still be ugly. <laughs> However, I haven't ever really met anyone who saw him seriously the worse off for drink. There is no doubt that he did manage to consume a lot. There was always champagne before, or whiskey and soda before lunch, and then there'd be many wines, and then brandy afterwards. But he did always like to have a glass of very weak whiskey and soda. It was always a prop close at hand, and a cigar. The cigar spent many hours not just out in the ashtray, and the glass remained untouched for long periods of time, but they were always there. And on one occasion, he observed, I've taken more out of alcohol than alcohol has taken out of me. <clears throat> but even he must have overestimated his consumption. On a train journey, he asked his friend and advisor, Professor Lindemann, Prof, how many pints of champagne in cubic feet have I consumed in 24 years at the rate of a pint a day, and how many railway carriages would it fill? Lindemann replied, only a part of one, Winston, whereupon a disappointed Churchill observed, so much to achieve, so little time remains. <laughs> One of the greatest pleasures in my grandfather's life was racing. The day came when he decided to name his new racehorse after his favorite champagne produced by his friend, Odette Paul Roger. There were many occasions when we raised our glasses of Paul Roger to toast the horse Paul Roger. Winston Churchill had a keen taste for champagne and also for war. You might say he was a connoisseur of both. In his very first book, The Malacand Field Force, written when he was still a lieutenant, he compared them. A single glass of champagne imparts a feeling of exhilaration. The nerves are braced, the imagination is agreeably stirred, and the wits become more nimble. A bottle produces a contrary effect. Excess causes a, comat a comatose sens insensibility. So it is with war, and the quality of both is best discovered by sipping. With his mind on war, he said, I could not live without champagne. In victory, I deserve it. In defeat, I need it. In the spring of 1959, we were all having lunch at Chartwell, when he asked my mother if she and I would like to go with him on Aristotle Onassis' yacht that summer. I just held my breath until she accepted. I was so worried she wouldn't accept what seemed to me the most exciting invitation I'd ever had. A few weeks later, after I'd been equipped with what seemed like a bridal trousseau, we boarded the Christina in Monte Carlo Harbor, ready to embark on the most glamorous holiday imaginable. As we sailed out of the harbor towards Italy, Greece, and Turkey, the guest list could have come from the pages of an Agatha Christie novel. There was the multi-millionaire shipping magnate and his beautiful young wife, Tina. Their two children, Alexander and Christina, all of these eventually to have their own terrible tragedies. The diva, Maria Callas, and her rather boring and much older husband. There was Winston Churchill, his wife, Clementine, his daughter, Diana, and his granddaughter, Celia, that was me. Also in tow, the usual Churchillian entourage, a private secretary and his wife, a bodyguard, a valet, and a lady's maid. They did not travel light, but I think quite lightly compared to nowadays and how our now statesmen travel, but it, was, it seemed quite a lot of people at the time. And the scene was set for an idyllic holiday on the most luxurious yacht in Glittering Company. Ari and Tina Onassis were the most attentive hosts, Maria Callas the most aggravating guest. 
to all of us save one. <laughs> My grandfather once observed, we are all worms, but I do believe that I am a glowworm. <laughs> it was naturally and generally assumed that, as always, the attention of the world press would be directed on the glowworm. It soon became clear that this was not to be. Jealous at having to share the limelight, Callis decided to turn it to her advantage, and her personal team of paparazzi awaited us at every stop to photograph her as near to Churchill as possible. Once rumbled, she was given misinformations to our plans, and her followers were no longer on our trail. They must have gone to another port and been very aggravated when we never turned up. <laughs> but peace reigned for a while. One day, we arrived in the magnificent amphitheatre at Epidaurus to find it absolutely full of flowers. Callas turned to my mother and said, Oh, Diana, what kind people, what wonderful flowers. But please tell me, why do you think they're in the shape of a V? I'll never forget the look of fury on her face. And my mother, with, I have to say, some satisfaction, replied, Because, Maria, they're not for you, they're for Papa. By this time, it was not just Callis's spoilt and ill-mannered behavior which concerned us all. Day by day, it became increasingly clear and fascinating for me that a romance was being acted out in front of our very eyes. Onassis and Callis had embarked on one of the most famous love affairs of the century. The end of the cruise, both marriages would be over, but for the time being, the show had to go on. And go on it did. Italy, Greece, Turkey, the Bosphorus, and the Dardanelles at dead of night in case the memory upset Churchill. The next morning he said to me, they thought I wouldn't know where I was. But of course I knew exactly where we were. Of course he did. He was fascinated by maps. In fact, I believe that the map room in the White House was initiated after he took his map man with him during the war. And so he knew exactly where we were, mile by mile and hour by hour. And so no one could fool him. The young Prince Juan Carlos, the future King of Spain, the singer Gracie Fields, and the patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church all came to pay their respects. And there was such a furore when we got back to Monte Carlo, my grandfather's departure went almost unnoticed. Callas and her by now estranged husband had already departed, leaving Tina Onassis to fight her way through the paparazzi, never to return. That was the first of my holidays with my grandfather. I just happened to be an available grandchild of an appropriate age to accompany him to the south of France over the next few years. There I had my first taste of grand hotels, or in fact of any hotels at all. My bath was run, my clothes unpacked, there was always someone hanging around wanting to do something for me. Now I would find that maddeningly irritating. But then it actually was quite fun, and I quite naturally assumed that this was what hotels were all about, and I really decided that I would have spent a lot of time being pampered like this in the future. Not surprisingly, hotels, however good, have never quite lived up to those early experiences. But these were essentially painting holidays and the warmth of the Mediterranean sun. Travelling with Winston Churchill no way prepared me for the hurly-burly of modern travel. We would drive right up to the aeroplane, where the car, as well as the passengers, carried the canvases, the paints and the easel, the essential elements of the days ahead. It was only later, when I travelled on my own, I realised the request for no pipe or cigar smoking had been amended to allow my grandfather to puff away on his cigar. I don't think he'd have been deterred in any, any case, because during the war, when he was flying in pressurized, unpressurized planes, he was told he had to wear an oxygen mask. He said, well, I will, as long as you adapt it so I can smoke my cigar at the same time. <laughs> A posse of police outriders would escort us from Nice Airport to the border of, of Monaco, where the precision, with precision usually associated with the brigade of guards, the Monagas police would change place with the French. And after this ceremonial arrival, we would settle down to a time of peaceful companionship. Mm. 
painting trips, drives, and picnics. And for me, the best thing was to have to myself the grandfather everyone thought they owned. On one occasion, he was invited to go to a nuclear, an American nuclear submarine. And he couldn't go, so I was sent, aged about 17. And I remember I took much more interest in the ice cream machine than anything else. <laughs> Having experienced a lifetime during which his expenses always exceeded his income, my grandfather was most understanding about money. He would often ask, are you all right for money, darling? And at the same time, he would press a bundle of notes into my hand. As I thanked him, I would wonder whether they were his winnings from the previous night's flutter in the casino. There was a, a secret passage that went underground from the Hotel de Paris in Monte Carlo to the casino so he could get there without anyone knowing he'd been. I was with him when he put the final brushstroke on one of his last paintings, a dazzling still life of oranges and lemons, an enduring memory of Mediterranean holidays. Whenever I look at it, I remember that day and I hope that my grandfather is fulfilling his ambition for the afterlife, which, of which he wrote, when I get to heaven, I hope to spend a considerable portion of the first million years painting and so get to the bottom of the subject. When I was 18, I did what in England is called the season, which meant that I spent the summer attending debutante balls, garden parties, and racing at Ascot. All these activities, relics of a past age, were designed originally to find a suitable husband. I was not expected to do that, but it was a very enjoyable interlude between school and the grown-up world. I decided to give my ball at the end because I thought it would be more fun and I would have made more friends. But as the date drew nearer, I was concerned that it would be a terrible flop. I need not have worried. From the moment my grandfather walked in, it was a guaranteed success. He stayed until one in the morning, smoking a cigar, sipping champagne, and tapping his feet to the music. My friends were always welcomed by my grandparents at Chartwell. And after a leisurely day of croquet and tea on the lawn, we would sit down to the usual sumptuous dinner. After coffee, my grandmother would always rise from her chair, catch the eye of the ladies in terribly old-fashioned English custom, and leave the men to their brandy and cigars. I will never forget the look of terror in one young man's face when he realized that I was leaving him alone with Winston Churchill. <laughs> he was only about 22 and had surely never had a cigar or a brandy. That night he had both, and uh, he said after the first few minutes of terror, he, he had a very nice time. My grandfather was always fascinated by young men. One day, in the summer of 1962, the peace was shattered, and my grandfather fell and broke his hip in Monte Carlo. He called us to the hospital. I went with his private secretary, and he sent all the medical staff out of the room, and he said, I want to die in England. At 88, it was a possibility, because he wasn't a well man, and so he said, you must do that. And he asked his private secretary, he said, you, won't, you will make sure that happens. And so his private secretary said, yes, and I promise it will. And he said, I felt terrible promising because I don't think I can fill that, fulfill that promise. Anyway, he called London, and the Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, sent a VC-10 from the Royal Air Force to collect him. I held his hand as we flew from, from Nice to London. And all I could do was hope and pray that he would make it. So he was transferred from the plane to the waiting ambulance, he suddenly seemed to rally. He saw a little group of air, airport workers who were there absolutely silent, and he looked at them, he smiled, and he gave them the V sign, and we just all breathed a sigh of relief, and we knew that he was going to make it. Life did continue, but at a much slower pace. There was one final visit to France, otherwise his time was spent between Chartwell and the house in Hyde Park Gate. I'm sure any of those who are old enough to know, old enough will know exactly where they were on the day that President Kennedy died. I was with my grandfather, and the two of us sat and watched the television together as the dreadful story unfolded. It was placed on the dining room table, 
and there we sat as history was made before our eyes. Tears poured down my grandfather's cheeks as the news came in that the young president was dead. And again, the sight of his beautiful wife, still wearing her blood-stained clothes, bravely watching the new president being sworn in. They seemed young to everyone, but how young they must have looked to the old man approaching his 90th year. On the 30th of November, 1949, his 75th birthday, Churchill had said, I am ready to meet my maker. Whether my maker is ready for the great ordeal of meeting me is another matter. <laughs> 15 years later, we celebrated his 90th birthday. The unspoken thought in everyone's mind that that meeting would not be long delayed. Six weeks later, it seemed that the inevitable was about to happen. The country braced itself, the family prepared for the end, the patient slumbered on, his faithful marmalade cat snuggled up at his side. Some years before, he had predicted the day that he would die. It was therefore early on the morning of the 24th of January, 1965, that we gathered round his bed to say goodbye. Seventy years to the day and almost to the minute since his father, Lord Randolph, had died, Winston Churchill slipped imperceptibly away to meet his maker. <clears throat> the machinery of state began to put into action what had some years before been named Operation Hope Not. People came from far and wide and queued for hours to file past the catafalque in Westminster Hall and they lined the streets for the state funeral. The whole country was in shock. It seemed to affect old and young alike, and it was no tragedy. He was quite ready to go. The faithful servant, who had served six monarchs, was restored to his family by the side of the Thames. There he began his last journey down the river to the railway station, the cranes along the dockside dipping their heads in salute. We buried him at Bladen, next to his parents and his brother Jack, and in sight of Blenheim, where he had been born 90 years and so many adventures before. My Aunt Sarah had the best words to describe that extraordinary day and the journey from Westminster along the streets of London to St Paul's Cathedral. Winston Churchill was taken on a gun carriage, escorted by marching troops and mass bands. The men of the family walked behind the coffin, and the women rode in the Queen's carriages. This is my aunt's description. <clears throat> now we were nearing St Paul's Cathedral. I remember seeing it silhouetted in flames from the roof of the Savoy, standing by my father's side all those years ago. We had been told it was not necessary to curtsy to the Queen and her family. They were already in their pews. For the first time in English history, the monarch waved the precedent and waited for her humble servant. He loved Chartwell. At one time, both he and my mother had planned to be buried there, near his poodles, Rufus I and Rufus II. But one day, a few years before, the idea came to him to return to his birthplace. He had survived almost a century, and his thoughts as he wandered around Blenheim that day must have been all-embracing, for he decided to commit his bones to the earth where his beloved father and mother and brother Jack awaited him. The battle hymn of the Republic crashed through the great cathedral as the bombs had crashed around it in 1940. Ghosts, they only live in our desire. It is perhaps our memories that see the mist hover over the lake and fireflies dance where no human could. He is gone. A barge did come and carry him on. The steel cranes bowed their heads the gull's grey sky held, and the Thames ran softly on. He is gone. What is mortal of him lies at Bladen. The first 20 years of my life were spent growing up with my grandfather. I have spent the last years with him in a very different way. I have travelled through the letters and diaries of his earlier years. I have retraced his footsteps through the forests of Cuba, where he rode with the Spanish forces against the Cuban guerrillas. I have traveled all over South Africa, reliving his adventures in the Anglo-Boer War. To Morocco, where he insisted on taking President Roosevelt 
to the, see the sun setting on the Atlas Mountains, and of course, to the United States, which he called my other country. I've learned much about the man who, on becoming prime minister, said, I felt as though I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and this trial. I've been reminded of his belief in his own destiny, in his own words at the age of 23 in a letter to his mother, I have faith in my star that I'm intended to do something in the world. His courage, both physical and moral, have constantly been in evidence. His power of communication and his wicked sense of humor. It has been said that Hitler could make you believe that he could do anything, but that Churchill could make you believe that you could do anything. And without pomposity, his wit dealt with a sort of tricky situation which leaders sometimes find themselves. He was sitting in the margins of a wartime conference in Washington, and an inebriated GI appeared in the door and, a, and addressed him Churchill said, hey fat, so where's the John? The Prime Minister replied, turn left down the corridor, the door is marked gentlemen, but don't let that deter you. <laughs> Churchill showed how wit and humour are a useful part of the armoury for everyday life. When an opposing speaker in a parliamentary debate noticed that Churchill was apparently dozing, he asked, must you fall asleep when I'm speaking? To which Churchill replied without opening his eyes, no, it is purely voluntary. <laughs> and when Lady Astor, a political opponent, said, Winston, if you were my husband, I'd put poison in your coffee, he replied, and if you were my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> What would have happened if Winston Churchill had not been called to lead his country in its darkest hour? Without him, who, in the words of President Kennedy, on making him an honorary citizen of the United States, would have mobilized the English language and sent it into battle? Who else could have offered blood, toil, tears, and sweat to such effect? Without Winston Churchill, the world would be a different place. I'm going to end my Aunt Sarah again with her tribute to her father. Forgive me if I do not cry the day you die. The simplest reason that I know you said you'd rather have it so, and that I held my head serenely high, remembering the love and glory that we knew. Forgive me if I do not cry the day you die. Forgive me if I do. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions, if anyone would like. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mrs. Bush. That's very kind, thank you. That means a lot to me. My grandmother was an extraordinary person, and she was, she, was a life, she was a lifelong liberal, which was fine when my grandfather was in his liberal period, because <laughs> he started life as a conservative, and then for 20 years he was a liberal, and then he became a conservative again. So he said, I ratted and I re-ratted. <laughs> but she kept, she kept her political thoughts to herself but she had very strong views on the people, some of the, his friends who she didn't necessarily like. And, but she was very much, she centered her life around him. And they had, he said that he made two decisions at Blenheim, to be born and to get married, and he'd never regretted either. And that with my grandmother, he said, we lived happily ever after, and I really believe they did. It didn't mean that they were in each other's pocket all the time, but they definitely, and he could not have been an easy man to be married to. And when I said, you know, 
everything centered around him, everything did center around him. So one knows from various letters that, and I know from experience that when, when my grandfather went away, my grandmother then would do all the things that she wanted to do, and suddenly we'd all be invited to go and take our friends, and she'd take us to the theater, and, also, and she lived a completely different life when he wasn't there to when he was. But I also think that the only people, probably, that, my, that who took my grandfather for granted, the only people after the war were his grandchildren, because we knew no better. And so therefore, we just liked being with him. For us, he was just grandpapa. And that way, we weren't, we weren't asking him boring questions. And could he tell us about the war? Or what was he doing in this particular thing? We just wanted to be with him and to go and feed the animals. And I think for him, that was quite nice. Oh my goodness, the question was, how did my grandfather shape my personality? Well, I don't know. He gave me red hair, but apart from that, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. I mean, it would be nice if, if I had some of his personality, but I have no idea. I, wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't presume. It's been lovely being with... Your grandfather's paintings, and are you also an artist? No, I'm not. My sister is an artist. But he, painting was something he really loved. He really loved painting. And it was one of the best things for him. And he started painting after, in 19, 1915, after the Dardanelles disaster in, in Turkey, and when he was at his lowest ebb. And from that time on, he always, except in the Second World War, wherever he went, he took his paints with him, even to the trenches of the First World War. And he, he, his paintings are really rather lovely. And he, he, gave several, he gave paintings to several presidents. He went, the one painting he did in World War II was when he hijacked President Roosevelt and took him to Marrakesh. And the minute the, he took, then he took the president to the airplane. My grandfather's still wearing his silk brocade dressing gown with dragons embroidered on it. And he went, <laughs> took him to the airport like that and then went back and painted the one picture he did of the Katubia Mosque in Marrakesh, which he gave to President Roosevelt. And he certainly gave another painting to President Eisenhower and one to President Truman. And so, sorry, you didn't get one. <laughs> <laughs> but so, um, he, really, he really loved, loved painting. It gave him so much pleasure. And I think it was his sort of way of beating stress and relaxing. He just went and lost himself in his painting. Well, I mean, he certainly, I mean, as personally, I can see, having, look, having written a book about the, his early life, he was playing with words when he was a child. You can see it in his letters. He was very precocious verbally. And, but, so he was a joy to be, I mean, he would be reciting poetry. I mean, he always was a great joy to listen to because he had a lovely way of speaking. But like his writing, it was always... Very simple. You didn't have, it wasn't, he didn't speak convoluted English. He's, he liked good, simple, plain words. And so, it's, so he's easy to read and easy to listen to. And you never can say, what did he mean by that? You know perfectly well what he meant all the time. When you what? look at his history, you see the uh, extraordinary personal physical courage, even going back to when he was a lieutenant in South Africa, Egypt and the rest. I think it's kind of a family trait from in the family, or was it, was it something unique to him? Or you know well, I don't know. He certainly, he was um, looking, he, he was, he, was he, he decided, he was, he was scared that he wasn't going to have the courage. He was scared that he was going to be scared, so he was determined to prove to himself that he did have the courage. And also, he wanted to make himself very visible, because he wanted, he was, his time in the army, 
was his sort of prelude to his time in politics, and he wanted to make a name for himself. But no, well, I mean, during the World War II, my Uncle Randolph, he had, ra had a rather a good army time, and my youngest son has recently done two tours in Afghanistan, so the tradition <coughs> continues. It's strange to think that he was there, you know, a few years ago, and in 1890s, his great-grandfather was fighting the same war. I mean, when will we ever learn sense? <laughs> and so that, so, but it, it's everything, go, it seems that things don't seem to change. Well, that's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. I've never heard that, I must say. <laughs> but I have to tell you, he was a particularly aggravating guest for some hostesses, and that would have really, really got them going, wouldn't it? <laughs> when he was staying in the, with uh, Harry Bird, Harry Bird Jr., delightful senator, his father, he remembered, he had, when I was talking to him, he had the oldest living memory of my grandfather. When he, was, when he was 14, Harry Bird Jr. was with his parents in the governor's mansion in Virginia when my grandfather went to stay there in the early 30s. And apparently my grandfather was very aggravating and Mrs. Bird was absolutely infuriated by him, whereas the governor and his young son, they thought he was simply wonderful. So there was, you know, not just did she have a difficult guest, but she had a, a dispute within her family over it. And apparently he used to say he wanted the meals at the times he wanted. He used to work on what he called tummy time. So to hell with the time and the place, he would have it when he wanted. So could we change the times, he said, and could we eat this, 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 and this? And on one occasion there was a dinner and it was a big dinner at the governor's mansion and they were serving chicken. And the butler came around with the chicken and he handed it to my grandfather and he, and he said, would you like, what bit of the bird would you like? My grandfather said, I'd like some breast, please. And the stuffy lady sitting next to him said, Mr. Churchill, in this country we say white meat or dark meat. <laughs> my grandfather was totally politically un incorrect. Anyway, the next morning, she received a little posy of flowers with a card which said, please pin this on your white meat. <laughs> so. Well, what was the relationship between my, my grandfather and Gandhi? Well, there, couldn't, there was nearly, could have been a meeting between my grandfather and Gandhi in the Boer War, because on the Battle of Spion Kop, which my grandfather went up and down this little mountain three times in one day, the Gandhi was a stretcher bearer, and so he was running up and down too, but they didn't meet. And so um, I don't think he had a relationship with him. I think that we must, we're judging him. We judge, tend, people tend to judge now by today's standards, not by the standards of like 100 years ago. So um, obviously he did, he said rather unfortunate things about Gandhi, which um, people didn't like, and I don't think Gandhi liked very much. So I couldn't say that they probably had a glowing relationship. Well, I mean, I think Montgomery had a conflict with lots of people. <laughs> but um, we used to play croquet with him. He was a very good croquet player, and he loved croquet. And so he used to come to chart them, and we'd all play croquet. And he and my grandmother were exceedingly competitive. <laughs> but as far as Eisenhower's concerned, I think they had a very good relationship. And of course, they didn't always agree. But at the end of the day, one that my grandfather may have given, had his ideas and made suggestions, 
the end of the day, he all, because he believed in the military, because he'd been in the military himself, he never overruled them at the end of the day. He may have tried to persuade them, and sometimes he might have done, but his, the relationship, I think, was good. Should we, are we over, finished? <laughs> well, I'm ter I'd like to thank you all very much for really being a lovely audience. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sands. I uh, guess you can tell from the response of our audience that uh, we've enjoyed your being here tonight as our William Waldo Cameron Forum on Public Affairs speaker. And we would hope that you will accept this small token of our appreciation for your being here and your visit to the George Bush Presidential Library Center. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And enjoy your well, stay in Aguilar. Thank Aguilette. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you take your seats for just a moment, please, while our guests depart, and a few housekeeping things. On behalf of the Foundation and the Texas A&M University Press, we do appreciate your being with us this evening, both in person here in the Hagler Auditorium, as well as those who are viewing us through the internet. For those of you who may not be members of the Foundation's Associates Program, we'd welcome your support. You can call our office directly or visit www.georgebushfoundation.org. Membership does have its privileges. It means being the first to hear about our events. You'll get our newsletters and invitations to events like this evening. Two, without the financial support of our donors, events like this just simply won't take place. Next month marks the 25th anniversary of the election of George Bush as the 41st President of the United States. The Foundation will be sponsoring a number of events in celebration of both the President's election and his inauguration. Those of you who are members should have received Save the Date cards already. Finally, a book sale is going on in the lobby. Two of Ms. Sand's books have been recently republished by our very own University Press. Churchill Wanted Dead or Alive and From Winston with Love and Kisses are both available in the lobby. You might want to take both of them home with you uh, this evening. Again, thank you so much for coming. Have a wonderful evening.